Bastard blood flies everywhere. I told you we should have taken the Crystal Road. And I told you that we're outlaws. Well, you want every bounty hunter in Storm harrying us from here to the Holy Capital? Besides, what's wrong with a shortcut through nature's splendor? Get off. The Deadlands claim more of the realm each day. But a place like this still exists is a miracle in itself. Blood flies and all. We'll be back in Imperial land soon. You all right? Never better. Sounds like it. <laughs> that there is a fine hound. Soon took to hunting. Fearless as you like. It's good to have you back, Torkel. Now, we don't want to be caught in the forest after nightfall. I suppose not. I still don't understand how Torgal found his way back to Clive. Like, it's a little bit of a contrivance. Oh, yeah, Torgal's just, you know, here. And no one has any questions or anything like that. He's just sort of at your side again. Whatever. Moving on. Did I mention there'd be deadly beasts? There'll be deadly beasts. Nothing a trained assassin can't handle long. How reassuring. You're welcome for that and the shortcut. This game will open up a little bit. And it... I'm not quite sure how to describe it. I would say this is a bit of a dated reference. But it's sort of a semi-open world. Kind of in the vein of like... No, I didn't play the second one, but say, um, oh god, what the hell was that first-person shooter? Rage. A game like Rage, where you had this sort of open environment, but it wasn't really open. Now, you had a certain amount of choice and what quests you were going to do, but you more or less had a oh, series that you were supposed to go through. Side quest, sure, side quest, but your main quest line, you had to go through it linearly. And the environments themselves weren't big open spaces or an open world where you just pick a direction and go that way. They were sort of semi, almost hallway kind of things where you pass from one area to the other. Now, this game does seem to be a little bit more open than Rage was. It sort of gives you the impression at times that you are playing an open world game but a lot of it seems to be this kind of thing that we're doing right now where well you just got to get to the other side of this not that there's really anything wrong with that i'm one of those people who thinks that this fascination where everything has to be an open world game nowadays is very misguided like oh well this game people say it's good but it's linear <laughs> like well you know what you know some games should be linear. In fact, I think most games should be linear. Not everything should be an open world. And I honestly, I think the Final Fantasy games are better as linear, you know? It gives you a bit of a tighter story to be able to tell. name is he doing this far south looking for food no more walls where he's from the north was one of the first parts of storm to fall to the blight poor sod i'd invite him over for a cup of tea if i didn't think he'd eat the dog and stay out of its path. There's been a lot of talk about this blight thing. 
And unfortunately, the game hasn't really provided a whole lot of information as to what the hell that is. But it's reasonable to imply that it is. Understand that it's got to be some sort of um, a disease, like a blight. You're generally thinking of some kind of a disease, or like a um, disease involving plants or something. So, if you have this sort of mass death of vegetation like that, that could really screw with the wildlife. And the, apparently, this giant armadillo-looking thing eats wolves, so there are no wolves where it came from, so it's down here hunting wolves. Giant... Giant monsters in this world. <laughs> After you. Thank you kindly. The ruins, they're everywhere, aren't they? Some say there was a time they blocked out the stars. Down was the only way left for them to go. There's probably a lesson to be learned from that. But it can wait. Come on. We've seen these kinds of ruins before, the hideout of the of the uh, bearers, where you're setting up shop in kind of this ancient ruin of a previous civilization of advanced technology, which is long gone, and the people who are still living in the area don't really understand the technology. I'm going to guess that at some point in the game we're going to get some sort of an airship and that airship will be based on this old technology. Sort of like what we had seen in like Final Fantasy VIII, where the garden was part of an ancient complex and it was actually like mobile. And it was technology that the people who owned it didn't really understand it or really even know it was there. Um, Final Fantasy X as well delves into that, where you had the people of Spira living in a world that was previously technologically advanced, but due to a number of concerns, mostly like religious dogma and all of that, technology has regressed back to a much more primitive way. Now in this, I haven't seen anything to indicate why uh, the people of this world are living in something of a dark age. Um, we can, uh, let's draw a few conclusions now without any real evidence. Let's say it has something to do with the magic. Now, people who are able to cast magic, I guess they seem to come about it genetically. There's nothing done to them. But maybe this is sort of like a Mass Effect kind of thing. So in Mass Effect, you had the people that could use Element Zero powers. Uh, what did they call them? Uh, biotics. People could use biotics, which is essentially magic in this in the world of Mass Effect, where they could, like, telekinesis and all that kind of shit. Now, the people that could do that were either intentionally or unintentionally exposed to this um, element which caused them to develop these powers. Now, to an extent, this is the result of sort of a experimentation or a technological advancement. Something was done to them to give them that, those powers, and other races, unlike humans, seem to be born with these powers, but it has something to do with exposure to this element zero. So, uh, maybe not a perfect... Um, Maybe not a perfect comparison to be made, but I'm going to guess that perhaps Xenogears, how? Oh, perhaps that's a better example. The game Xenogears, or Xenogears, or however you want to pronounce that, ether powers existed in this world, but the ether that all the people possessed was actually the result of sort of genetic tampering. People were created and they gained ether powers based on the sort of genetics of uh, being 
spread out into the population of the ability to use these powers. So I'm going to take a guess, shot in the dark right now, and say that the magic that the bearers in 16 use has something to do with the technology that's ruined all over the place. Must be a nest nearby. Keep your eyes open. Of course, everything I'm saying is just complete speculation. I have really no freaking idea what's going on yet. It's one of those things where, especially with these, the most of these games, I don't really want to see spoilers. So, in general, I tend not to look at a lot of the pre-release hype for these things. I want to go into this blind. I think I've mentioned this in earlier episodes, but... I was aware that you had a... There's a character named Clive, who's the main character, which unfortunately I'd forgotten when I started the game. That was pretty much about it. Oh, and that there was something of a medieval European setting. Those were really the only two things about this game that I knew. So it's perhaps what I'm talking about might have been revealed in this sort of pre-release hype that Square tends to do. But I just didn't read it because I was trying to avoid that stuff. So it's a good chance that you know more about this than I do. Animal Instinct. <laughs> My law. Oh, oh, you gotta do some stuff with Torgal. At least one of us knows these woods. Thank you, Torgal. So let's speculate a little bit. These things are probably airships flying around in the sky, and they something happened to more or less end that era. And all of these things, whether they all came down at once or just as a result of them wearing out or something like that, they all crashed. And their ruins are still around, and some people live in them, but in general people tend to avoid them, I guess, I don't know. Maybe not the most hospitable place to live. The bearers seem not to mind it, but it seems to be that they're living there only because no one else does. But perhaps the technology, it definitely seems like the technology is something that these people don't understand anymore. Maybe it was a different, uh, maybe it was a different civilization that built these airships and that the they were sort of watching over everybody else. Or perhaps the people that are alive today or the descendants of the people who control those airships. I don't know. We're way too early in the game to have any idea what the hell's going on there. All we know is there was an ancient civilization. I don't think we're looking at aliens or anything like that. I think this is just us seeing the ruins of the old civilization. So Xenogears was big about that. Basically the entire game in Xenogears, you are stumbling across relics of the ancient civilizations that came before it. That being either the gears or some of the old buildings or pieces of the freaking spaceship that crashed on that planet. Just nothing but just pieces of previous civilizations all over the place. Final Fantasy VII did this as well. You had the Cetra the ancients you had the city of the ancient stuff like that around eight of course i mentioned earlier with the gardens uh nine you don't really see that kind of thing because nine was more of a there wasn't like a dark ages everybody was in ten of course that's basically the plot of ten was uh religious religious imposed uh, religiously imposed technological regression a dark age 12 not really 13 sort of I mean people are still living in that technologically advanced world but none of them really have an understanding of it because they're being taken care of by these god machine things. Whatever, I'm, I'm getting off track here. That's 
saw Chaff. You'd better hope so. This shouldn't take too long. So much for your shortcuts. What? Still short, just not quite as quick. But it'll be a damn sight quicker if you help me. My thoughts exactly. This game is sort of doing what I had seen in Final Fantasy VII Remake, which meant, which was that they put a lot of sort of spectacle into the boss fights. There isn't just some like, oh, well, this is big monster, let's go fight it. They gotta have this big epic, just battling it out, like going all out kind of thing with the intense music and that. And I guess there's nothing really wrong with that. But it does tend to make the boss fights drag out a little bit. In the Final Fantasy VII Remake, the first boss battle you fight is the Guard Scorpion, of course. And you'd think your first boss battle would be something that you get through pretty quickly and all that. But it doesn't really play out quickly because they want to show off the spectacle. They want, you, want, you to, be, they want it to be memorable. But it does sort of drag out. So you're looking at this thing. It's a damaged sponge. We damage it a bunch of times. We stagger it a few times. You got to wail on it a bunch of times. And it's sort of a way of having the game have a sort of sense of difficulty. So, so far this game hasn't actually been that difficult. But by having enemies be things that you need to wail on a lot, it sort of makes it feel like you're earning your win. Of course, that makes some sense. I can understand why they do that, but it does make things take perhaps longer than it should. <laughs> I have to say, though, this is kind of a... Uh, going along with the sort of a spectacle and the effort that they're putting into production values here. This enemy looks just amazing. Its animations are so over the top. That's something I want to get in before I have to stop talking. The... You're kind of missing something nowadays with more realistic character models than humans. So if you look at earlier 3D era Final Fantasy games like 7 and 9, you had low detail, not particularly realistic looking models where they had these over the top, overly exaggerated animations to really be expressive. Now as the technology got more advanced and the character models looked more human, you didn't really need to have those over the top animations because you could read more subtle expressive details in them. But you're kind of missing something when you get rid of those over the top details. Now this thing isn't a person, it doesn't look like a person, it doesn't have the movements of a person, so you can get away with being over the top. Plus for gameplay purposes, wanting to let the player know when they can dodge attacks and all that kind of stuff. You kind of want to have big wind-ups. Dominant. I am. I. Well, not by choice, mind. Old bloody Rome of strapping young lads. And it was this sorry sack of bones round who saw fit to home. Sid. You say you want to help Dominance and Bearers. Well, what's in it for you? What's in it for me? The same as for all of us. What we want and deserve. Save for our knack, dominance and bearers are no different from anyone else. The ability to use magic or summon great beasts should command respect, but instead has left us outcasts. 
our kind are used and discarded like tools, yet we are men, so why must we die as less? I see. So what you're saying is you want to start a war. <laughs> ah, you flatter me, lad. But my days is a firebrand along behind me. No, I only wish to offer our kind a of choice. A place where we can die on our own terms. Huh? 